Hello everyone and welcome to a special program. Many of us are embarrassed to talk about our mental health struggles, which in actual fact doesn't help us or the people around us. Tanya Fight and myself find it very important to share our struggles with mental health and our victories over them, hoping those experiences may help others. We want to find out where the core of these problems or feelings lies. We want to identify and solve them by mental exercising, um, CBT, for example, social interaction, avoiding triggers, diet, etc. Most importantly, how can our faith and knowledge in the Bible truths help us in this? We want to raise awareness about certain mental health conditions, not to condone the behaviours or the expressions associated with those conditions, but to help our viewers recognise the signs and symptoms of certain mental struggles. Today we want to tell you that you are not alone and there is hope. And even if you are not suffering from any of these conditions, there may be people around you that are struggling and hopefully you can offer them help and point them in the right direction. While the information, thoughts and ideas expressed in this presentation are based on our education and scientific research, some are based on our own experience. You are advised to consult your healthcare professional before following any advice given in this presentation. Hello, Tanya. Thank you for your willingness to share. It's very nice to be doing this program with you. I'm very excited. Hello, Sosia. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Tanya, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, when I was living in the UK, I completed a counselling diploma through the Institute of Natural Healing. And I also completed a herbalism diploma through the BSY group and a vegetarian and vegan nutritional therapy diploma. And in South Africa, I completed a health spa therapy diploma and lifestyle counseling qualification through Be Free Lifestyle Center. The um, health spa therapies diploma was through Healing Hands International Mass Massage Academy. Um, my idea was to combine these qualifications in order to help people who are struggling with mental health problems since I struggled with mental health problems from a very young age and because I knew how it feels to suffer like that, I developed a compassion for other people who are suffering too. Um, at the moment, I'm working for Clash of Minds. It was formerly known as Amazing Discoveries Africa and I've been working for them for six years, almost seven years. Uh, for the first six years, I was employed to answer all the incoming questions about, you know, Bible prophecy, um, any kind of questions that came in. But my interest really was on the spiritual or the mental and emotional um, questions. And so my position has now changed. I'm now doing editing and I've started my own website it's called Mental Discoveries. It's www.mentaldiscoveries.co.za and with this website I've put all the information on there that I've collected over the years and all my experiences in order to help others who are suffering from mental health problems. Very nice and it's interesting that People very often, when they suffer from certain conditions, they become professionals in that area to help others. Um, 
So can you tell us as well, Tanya, why you decided to share your testimony today? The reason why I decided to share my testimony is because I feel like I have all this experience from all the years of struggling with symptoms and I put so much effort in to try and overcome all these symptoms. And if I can share it with other people, I'm hoping that these experiences will help others or at least give them some kind of a guideline as to how they can overcome their symptoms. Yes, absolutely. Very good. So um, we can start with a word of prayer and then um, you can share your testimony with us. Dear Lord, we want to thank you today for the opportunity to come together and to discuss mental health and to share our experiences. And if that can help someone, that then um, let your will be done and let people find courage and hope and also um, let our experiences serve as a guide and um, let them follow the advice that you have given with mental health and with physical health as well because we know that they are connected we thank you so much again um, we ask you to speak through us and we ask all these things in jesus precious name amen thank you so i'm going to begin by telling my own story and how my mental health problems started and what age at what age um, I grew up, the first seven years of my life, I grew up as an atheist. My parents were not Christians. Um, and in the first seven years, I didn't even know that God existed. I'd never heard of a God before. Um, and then just before my parents were converted and became Christians, um, I was playing outside in the garden. I was about seven. and. I looked up at the sky and I saw the clouds and I wondered in my heart, where do we come from? Where does the world come from? Where do humans come from? But my vocabulary was too limited to be able to form the question to ask my parents, where do we come from? So I couldn't get an answer from them. And I believe it was God who prepared me for my parents' conversion and for the news that there was a God because it wasn't long after that that my parents were converted and then they started teaching us about God and because I had this question inside me you know where do we come from I accepted this message about God's existence and um, I became converted at the age of seven so then my father was a lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch at the time and he's a zoologist so he was teaching evolution but now because of his conversion he could no longer teach evolution so my parents um, moved they bought a farm and my, my father resigned at the university and we moved away for a year and i enjoyed it there on the farm and then my father got a new position at the University of Western Cape um, as a researcher and we moved back to the city. So when we moved back, um, at first we went to a school just outside the city, about half an hour away from the city. And I was in that school for, I'm not sure how long, maybe three months, four months or something like that. And then we moved closer to the city to be closer to my father's work and I went to another school there. And I was about nine years old when we when I went to that school. And so at that time when we moved to that school, that was also around the same time when my father started to evangelize and started to preach um, about prophecies and gave lectures worldwide. And at the same time, I also started to feel that there were changes in in our life that we never had before which people refer to as spiritual attacks and i experienced this as well so at school i started being bullied um, and 
in that school close to the city. The bullying wasn't too bad, but it did it did affect me. And then we decided, my parents decided to move outside the city again. So we went back to that same school that I was in for about three or four months. And I was thinking like, now I'm going to be happy because there wasn't any bullying in that school before. But the day, on the first day, uh, when I arrived at that school, the bullying started. And it was a really difficult time for me in that school. And I was in, in that school for three years. So altogether, I was bullied for four years from the age of nine till the age of 13. And that's that's the the time when you are developing your, your identity and your self-esteem. It's when you discover who you are. And because I was bullied every day, it broke down my self-image um, and um, I even started to to see myself differently in the mirror when I looked in the mirror I didn't see the same person anymore um, there was a lot of hatred towards me for no reason I was a very shy reserved child so it wasn't that I did anything that would provoke others to bully me um, I was quite quiet but there was this intense hatred, especially from the boys in the whole class. The whole class was kind of against me. And um, the girls were more quiet, but the boys were just... <laughs> Every day, there, there was just something that they had to attack about my appearance, about who I was. Um, it, when I walked into the classroom, the boys would say, oh, look who just walked in, and then they would stick their fingers down their throat and pretend to throw up. Um, if anybody had to sit next to me, it would be a big scene because nobody wanted to sit next to me. Um, if we had to walk from the swimming pool back to class after swimming lessons, the boys would walk behind me and laugh at my skinny legs. Um, they would throw my food around in class because we were vegan or plant-based and they would mock my food. So eventually I started eating my food in the toilet because I was too scared to eat in front of people. Uh, I was tripped on the tar and I still have scars on my knees from that. I was ridiculed or mocked when I, when I laughed, when I spoke, when I sang, when I walked. So basically my whole person was under attack. I was, I, w I felt like I wasn't allowed to express any part of myself. I wasn't allowed to speak. I wasn't allowed to laugh. I was not allowed to express any ideas or thoughts or say anything because everything I said and did was disgusting, basically. That's how I felt. <clears throat> and um, I also had a lot of fear, you know, because I knew every day oh, that I had to go and face those children when I go to school. and. I, I was very close to God at that time and I read my Bible every night for, you know, comfort and, and strength to face the next day. And there was one specific verse that, um, that I used to um, memorize and it says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So I always used to repeat that in my head when I'm sitting in class being bullied. Um, and I was also a very sensitive person. That's the other thing. You actually get a term called highly sensitive person, HSP. And people who are highly sensitive like that, they, they're not only sensitive on an emotional level, but also sensitive to noise, sensitive to light, sensitive to a lot of busyness. And um, I'm also what people call an empath, where you absorb people's um, emotions and uh, you know their energies whether they are you know if they have a very high energy it, it can affect me and make me feel nervous if they have a calm energy it makes me feel more calm and um, I also started to to realize that I was struggling with my schoolwork I was struggling to understand what the teacher was saying when she gave class. I was struggling to understand what people were saying. I couldn't 
follow their conversations. Um, and I also, at one point, when things got too much for me, um, I made an appointment with the teacher and I asked her in private if she could maybe just ask the children to stop when they were bullying me like that because she just sat there and she didn't do anything. She just watched them bullying me and she said to me, I'm not going to fight your battles for you. So it felt like the whole class was against me, including the teacher. And when I didn't understand my schoolwork, she would come and stand behind me and hit my back with a ruler over and over and shout at me and say, for example, in maths class, she would say, where's your formula? Where's your formula? And she would hit me over and over. And I was too scared to say in front of everyone that I didn't even know what a formula was because I didn't understand the schoolwork. Um, so I just kept quiet and she just kept hitting me over and over. And eventually, at around the age of 12, 13, after four years of being bullied like that, I started to develop physical symptoms and emotional mental health symptoms. Um, so I started to develop severe depression and anxiety, social phobia. Um, I had a phobia for eating in front of people. I used to hide myself in the toilet. I had insomnia, couldn't sleep at night. And then um, I would be awake the whole night at home. And then I would hear my parents' alarm going off. And then I had to get up and go to school. And then I couldn't stay awake in class because I was so tired. I started to develop symptoms of, you know, body dysmorphia. It is a condition called body dysmorphic disorder where you focus really obsessively on certain body parts and you think that they are a lot worse than what they actually are. So my nose <laughs> was one of the, the features that I really hated and started to obsess about because that was one, one of the things that I was bullied about and my legs was the other thing. Um, and um, there was also a time where I thought, but maybe it's just, maybe I'm just unlucky with this class. Maybe because I wasn't bullied before in any other school besides the one just before that, I thought maybe I'm just unlucky. But then I started to have the same kind of attacks outside of school. Um, but for example, there was this boy when I was about 13 I was at my friend's house and we were standing outside. It was dark outside and she went inside quickly and he came and spoke to me and he was flirting with me and he came closer and I didn't really react or do anything strange or wrong to deserve any kind of lash out. But when he came closer to me, he laughed in my face and he said to me, did you really think that I would have gone for you? Maybe if you sawed some of your nose off, I would have gone for you. And so these these um, experiences inside the school and outside the school became evidence to me that there was something really <laughs> wrong with me. And I started to believe that the problem is me. Um, so, and I also started to have digestive issues, um, nausea, stomach cramps, you know, digestive problems and so on. And then at the end of primary school, when I turned 13, we obviously went to high school and then I wasn't with the same group of children anymore. Um, a lot of them went to other schools and so on in high school, but the damage was done. It didn't really matter to me that I wasn't bullied anymore in the high school because I was already damaged. Um, and so my symptoms, I just got worse the older I got. Uh, by the time I was 15, I had extreme anger outbursts. Um, I started to self-medicate with substances because I needed something to take the pain away. And, you know, I didn't know what else to do. Um, I had extreme mood swings, emotional instability, emotion dysregulation, identity issues, impulsiveness, um, interpersonal problems, you know, problems in my relationships. And as time went by, it got even worse. At the age of 18, I was hospitalized for the first time for my condition um, because of a 
impulsive, self-destructive act. <laughs> um, so I first went to the emergency and I stayed there overnight. And in the morning after I was stabilized, they transferred me to a psychiatric hospital. And they I received treatment, but it didn't help because I, I, I didn't want to open up to that psychologist <laughs> because he made me angry. So I just completely closed up and I was released but with no, no difference. Um, then as time went by, around the age of 23, I started to experience physical symptoms, like a lot of backache, like severe backache, especially my lower back, chills every day, chronic, chronic chills and sweating. Um, I had panic attacks, uh, paranoia, really bad paranoia. Um, I was very sensitive to, to noise, even more than I was when I was younger, and movement, a lot of busyness, I couldn't handle it, because my nervous system was, wasn't doing well. So, for example, if, if I was at a place where there were children running around and screaming and playing, oof, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't, it felt like I wanted to explode and just tell them to stop, because my, my nervous system couldn't handle it. And then I also... Um, at, at some point, my memory started to really get bad. So if, if, say, for example, I had to go to the shop and I only had to remember three things on my shopping list, if I only had three things to buy, I wouldn't remember it. I had to write down those three things, otherwise I would, it would just, I would go blank. Um, and in that same in that time period I also started to forget things like I would leave I would leave the tap running and I would go to my room and work on the computer for an hour and then I'd go to the kitchen and find the tap running completely full open um, for the last hour or I would leave the the iron on or the stove or you know the heater when I go out and because of this I start I started to develop like OCD, obsessive compulsive symptoms with re repetitive checking. Um, I had to check the stove like 20 times before I went out and everything else, the plugs, make sure that there's nothing that, that I could have left on. And even, even after checking it so many times, I would get in my car, drive, and when I'm at the first stop street, my brain would tell me, no, it's not off. And I'd have to turn around, go back, Go check it another 10 times and eventually it was just like okay i'm not even gonna go to town anymore i, I can't even leave the house anymore. that's how bad my paranoia and, and stress symptoms started to become um then um when i got older around the age of 32 i started to develop hypo hypomania symptoms it's a milder form of the full-blown mania that people with bipolar type 1 get. I had the bipolar type 2 symptoms with very severe depression episodes. And at that time, I, I realized that I better get some help because it was starting to become a danger to me um, where I, my life was in danger because of these episodes. I could, you know, end up behaving in ways that could in my life. So I went to go see a psychiatrist and um, I discussed all my symptoms with him and then I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, bipolar type 2 and with obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms or traits. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly go through the symptoms of the those three disorders. Um, so borderline personality disorder has nine symptoms and you need five out of the nine to be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And I had all of the nine. <laughs> um, so the first uh, symptom is fear of abandonment. Second one is intense, unstable relationships with splitting. I'll explain later what splitting is. Identity and self-image problems, impulsive, self-destructive behaviors, self-harm, extreme mood swings, chronic feelings of emptiness, explosive anger, and paranoia or dissociation. And then bipolar symptoms, are you have the manic episodes or hypomania if it's type 2, 
and the depression episodes and then OCD you get you get different um, subtypes of of obsessive compulsive disorder um, the one of the most common ones are the ones where people are um, very anxious about germs where they have to wash their hands say 20 times a day like I was doing with the repetitive checking but that was not the subtype that I had I had the repetitive checking and I had hypochondria sometimes I had some hypochondria um, episodes because I was so worried about these physical symptoms the chronic chills and all that that I was always worried what kind of a disease do I have and I was often, you know, often went for blood tests and nobody could find anything. And I also had the intrusive thoughts, the ruminations and obsessive thoughts and perfectionism. So I tried many different types of treatments over the years. And I really tried very hard <laughs> to get my symptoms under control. I was very dedicated to... Um, taking my medications every day at the same time um, if things if it wasn't helping I went back to the doctor I went to see so many different doctors in my lifetime I had so many blood tests done to try and rule out any other underlying conditions the different medications that I had tried in my life are serotonin reuptake inhibitors tricyclic antidepressants MAO inhibitors mood stabilizers, anti-convulsants, antipsychotics, tranquilizers, and lots of natural medicines as well. Um, but none of the medications or treatments that I tried helped me or cured me or stabilized me. Um, there, was, there were a few cases where an antidepressant could help me out of a really bad episode to, you know, that was making me feel suicidal. But um, that was about it. it. It didn't help me further than that. It could help me to, to come out of that state of mind, but not to stabilize me because I would have those same episodes coming back, whether I was on medication or not. And I also experienced a lot of side effects from the medications, um, like weight changes. Some of them made me pick up 12 kilograms in like two months some of them made me eat nothing and i lost a lot of weight and would weigh like 40 kilograms or even less 30 35. um some of them gave me insomnia and i couldn't sleep at all some made me sleep all day long <laughs> uh, most of them gave me extreme hair loss uh, and the doctors said that it's not it's not a common side effect but for some reason that's how my body reacted i had extreme hair loss it was like in bunches that my hair fell out um brain zaps it's like electric shocks in the brain especially when i moved my eyes to the side i would get this electric shock in my brain and um i also noticed that if i was on a particular medication for a long time say for a year i started to noticed that I was making more spelling mistakes than I would before. I would swap letters around like their E-I and their E-R-E. -E. I would swap them around, which I never did before. And I also lost my creativity. I'm a creative person. I like writing music and painting and writing poems and things like that. There was nothing, no creativity. I was like a zombie. Um, I was emotionally numb when I was on antidepressants, especially. Say, so if if I found out somebody died, I, I would just react like, okay, there was just nothing. I had no compassion, no empathy. I couldn't cry. If somebody else cried, I would feel like, mm, what is, why are you crying? It was just nothing, no emotion in me. Um, so obviously <laughs> the medications weren't working for me and I eventually uh, stopped trying with the medication route um, but I just want to add here that it's very dangerous to stop psychiatric medications suddenly um, you you always have to speak to your doctor because most psychiatric medications require you to wean off slowly because the brain is used to having you know 
is dependent on the medication and if you just suddenly take it away you can end up in the psychiatric ward so just be careful of that um in my lifetime i was hospitalized five times for my condition um three of them were because of my instability and to to stabilize me and two of the, them were because of injuries that were directly related to the disorder then um at the age of 35 um i had a near-death experience that really shocked me um and it was also again it was related to my condition and that's when i realized that if i don't find help i'm going to die i'm really going to die and not only that i might even lose my eternal life because the way i was trying to cope with my symptoms wasn't in line with the bible um you know god says we have to um, keep our bodies our bodies are the temple of god and i wasn't able to keep that rule because i was suffering so much inside with all these symptoms the depression the anxiety the paranoia and i didn't know how else to make it go away other than take a substance to make it stop because nothing else was working and so I, I knew that I had to turn to God for help because I had tried everything. I went to psychiatrists, I went to, to doctors, to GPs. I tried all the medications that there is, that is, that's available. And where else could I go? What else could I do other than go to God? He had to have the answer. So I prayed and really earnestly prayed and said to god what must i do now because now i've really tried everything and so after after that prayer he impressed me to start doing research now me <laughs> i'm not an academic person and research is very difficult for me because i struggle to understand you know how can i say scientific terms and so on but he impressed me to start doing research and so i started studying i started i went online i studied scientific articles and it took me a long time to 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 grasp what i was actually reading and i felt very frustrated and i but i don't even understand what i'm reading how am i supposed to get help through studying <laughs> but then eventually by reading lots of different articles on the same topic i started to understand better you know what these things were about and um, I want to share with you what I've learned through through this the research that I've done um, so I first want to start with uh, the statistics on mental health according to the World Health Organization in 2019 one in every eight people or 970 million people were living with a mental disorder and anxiety and depressive disorders were the most common. In 2020, initial estimates have increased by 26% for anxiety disorders and 28% for depressive disorders. So there's a lot of people struggling with mental health. Um, and they also say that most people don't have the proper care. Um, they experience stigmas, discrimination and violations of human rights. So it's really difficult for somebody with mental health to cope with their mental health problems and then they still have the, the added burden that they are rejected by people and that they don't get the care that they need. So in my research, I um, discovered something that, that was for me an eye opener. When I was younger and I was struggling with, with all these symptoms, I struggled to understand what mental illness was in the first place and I used to ask so many people, I asked doctors, I asked pastors, what is it, what is causing it, is it, is it, is it a spiritual problem? Some people would tell me um, it's Satan that makes you feel that way, some people would tell me it's a chemical imbalance, other people would tell me it's, it's your thought patterns and I, I just couldn't get an answer or, or grasp what it was really about until God revealed to me that it's all three of those things. It's the mind, the body, and the spirit, and that you have to treat the whole person in order to, to heal mental health problems. 
you have to you have to look at your thought patterns you have to look at your your body and your your brain chemistry and you have to look at your spiritual life and you have to treat the, the mind body and spirit simultaneously otherwise there's going to be gaps and you're not going to strengthen the whole person so um i'm going to go through the mind body and spirit and everything that i've learned within those three categories and i'll start with the mind first so in my studies um i learned about neural pathways that was one of the one of the very important things um that helped me to understand how mental health problems work. So a neuron generates an electrical impulse causing the cell to release its neurotransmitters. Electrical impulses use pathways to deliver their messages. Um, and electrical activity causes white matter to develop on along that pathway that you're using regularly. For example, if, if you are practicing to play a certain song on the piano your brain will use certain pathways to memorize that song and each time you play that song it, it um, adds like a strand of white matter along that pathway to strengthen it um, and if you practice it over and over and over it actually starts to you can actually see it like a white patch through the um, methods that they that they test for for um, white matter it's like a white patch on your brain in your brain um but there's one particular pathway that really interested me and it's called the amygdala prefrontal pathway and this is the pathway where the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex communicate with each other so the prefrontal cortex is the um the part of your brain behind the forehead and the amygdala, there's two of them on either side in the um, temporal lobes. And so the amygdala is responsible for detecting danger. Um, and it alerts the prefrontal cortex when it detects the danger. And it also activates the stress response by signaling the hypothalamus, which then signals the pituitary gland and the adrenal glands to release the adrenaline and cortisol. And the amygdala is also involved with other emotions like anger and fear and sadness and aggression. And the prefrontal cortex is responsible for processing and controlling emotions, um, impulse and behavior control, predicting consequences of actions, problem solving, planning, decision making, spirituality and reasoning. So this part of the brain helps to control your emotions and your behavior and your thoughts and the amygdala is the one that fires when when there's danger or uncomfortable emotions um so it's through communication between these two areas that our mind how, how can i say our, our brain helps to keep our thoughts, emotions, and behavior under control. So if there's lack of communication, you're going to struggle with your, your behavior. So there's this article, um, traumatic experiences disrupt amygdala prefrontal connectivity by Dong Hoon Oh, a researcher from the Department of Psycho Psychiatry at Hanyang University in Korea. And this article reveals that people with mental illness have less white matter in the amygdala, amygdala prefrontal pathway which indicates that there's poor communication between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala um, and they also found that stress and trauma can cause volume loss or shrinkage in the prefrontal cortex causing the prefrontal cortex to become underactive and stress and trauma overstimulates the amygdala causing it to become overactive um, so if the prefrontal cortex is too weak because of stress or trauma, then it can't control your, your anxiety and your paranoia and phobias and post-traumatic stress and OCD and all those symptoms related to anxiety. And it also, the prefrontal cortex also controls um, symptoms like uh, involved with the, 
the reward system, like bipolar, mania, and addiction, and things like that. Um, but there is, fortunately, something that can be done about the prefrontal cortex being too weak to um, deal with the signals coming from the amygdala, and that is to strengthen the prefrontal cortex, to calm the amygdala, and to in encourage communication between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Okay, so, to strengthen the prefrontal cortex, you have to you have to strengthen it from all three angles, from the mind, body, and spirit. So, from a mental angle, you can strengthen the prefrontal cortex through word and memory games, puzzles, cooking, learning, such as a language, an instrument, or a skill, maths, <laughs> not my strong point, problem solving, decision making, planning, setting goals, and avoiding um, certain types of television programs, video games, books, and music that weaken the prefrontal cortex. And then from a physical angle, you um, can strengthen the prefrontal cortex through proper nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, fresh air, and rest, and avoiding substances such as caffeine, cocoa, sugar, sweeteners, flavor enhancers, colorants, preservatives, alcohol, nicotine, and re recreational substances. But I'll go into more detail um, on those things a little bit later. Then from a spiritual angle, you can strengthen the prefrontal cortex by reading the Bible, um, praying, spending time in nature, spending time with God. Uh, the Bible promotes healthy beliefs, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Uh, and a relationship with God promotes love, kindness, forgiveness, compassion, empathy, good morals, good values, and a healthy conscience. Then to calm the amygdala, you also have to um, treat it from all three angles. From a mental angle, you can use strategies for emotional triggers, which I'll, I'll get into later. Correct faulty beliefs. Uh, process and re resolve trauma, process and resolve negative emotions, positive thoughts, holidays, enjoyable activities, relaxing, such as massage or even breathing techniques, socializing, creativity, and avoiding triggering activities such as um, unhealthy types of television programs, video games, books, and music. From a physical angle, it's the same as before, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and also spending time in nature near rivers, rocks, running water, forests, um, where negative ions are because they have a calming effect on the mind, and nature sounds as well. So spending time outside, you know, where you can hear the crickets and the birds, that's got a calming effect on the amygdala, and also avoiding substances that stimulate the stress response like caffeine, sugar, sweet, sweetness, sh um, cocoa, flavor enhancers, colorants, preservatives, alcohol, nicotine, and recreational substances. Then from a spiritual angle, you can calm the amygdala by reading and praying, reading the Bible and praying, spending time in nature and time with God, trust in God. And then I have a few verses here. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 verse 28, and do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, with, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> so this is, the amygdala is um, connected to anxiety disorders like OCD and post-traumatic stress disorder and so on. But um, there's also, if you want to calm the, the reward system in, in the case of bipolar and addiction, you can also apply these, this, these same mind, body and spirit principles that we just discussed. Okay, so then that was to strengthen the, the prefrontal cortex and to calm the amygdala and now to encourage communication between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala to strengthen that pathway so that you can gain control over your 
your thoughts and your feelings and behavior. There is a, um, a, a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically in cognitive behavioral therapy, you learn how to uh, recognize um, your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So in other words, if you, okay, you, each one of us, we have core wounds, say for example, my bullying. Um, these core wounds create beliefs. For example, people don't like me. Um, then these beliefs create thoughts like, for example, if somebody invited me to a tea party, I would think to myself, I don't want to go, I will feel left out because my belief is people don't like me. Then those thoughts will trigger feelings such as anxiety or sadness or worthlessness or loneliness. And the feelings trigger reactions within the body. For example, you'll have a knot in the stomach, maybe even you'll want to cry or, and those physical reactions become impulses. For, and in this case, I might want to run away or go and hide in my room and the behavior will the end result is that I didn't go to the tea party and all this is what cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy teaches you to look at that whole cascade when when you feel angry for example that's the the end result that's, that's the behavior so you have to trace it all the way back to the core wounds what what was the core wound and the belief the thoughts feelings body reactions and the impulses that led to the behaviors. Um, so the other thing that's really important here with the cognitive behavioral therapy is to, to, to look at these beliefs that have been created by your core wounds and to change them. So for example, here in the past, I would have believed people don't like me. So then I need to challenge that belief and change it into I am a likable person and then you can also um, look at evidence around you because not everybody in your whole life will reject you there are people who do like me but because of cognitive distortions I would have filtered that out and only seen the negative and I would have kept that belief that nobody likes me so then I must change that to I am a likable person so then that will again affect how I think then instead of thinking, I don't want to go to the tea party, I will feel left out. Um, I, it might become, I wonder if I'll meet someone with similar interests. And then the feelings will be happy and excited and normal body responses and the desire to go to the tea party and the behaviors will be, I went to the tea party. Um, Satan's goal is to target our beliefs because he knows about this cascade. He knows that when we have negative or false beliefs, that it will affect our whole person, our whole being, our thoughts, feelings, our body, our brain, our impulses, um, and our behavior. So that is the part that he is targeting. Um, and then he also offers false solutions for these false beliefs. He will make you feel like nobody loves you and you're, you're a nobody, you're a loser, you're ugly, nobody will ever love you. And then he offers you things like substances to try and, what can I say, to ease the pain. But if you can sort out the beliefs, then you won't have that pain because you will be settled in the truth about who you are and, and your self-worth. Besides stress and trauma, there are other factors that can also disrupt the communication between the amygdala and the um, prefrontal cortex and weaken the prefrontal cortex that it can't deal with your emotions. And these factors include self-blame or negative thoughts, um, believing lies like we just discussed now, faulty beliefs, perfectionism without mercy for self, um, that's one, one of the problems that I have um, and that ties in with the OCD symptoms because I developed the belief um, if I'm not perfect, I will be rejected because I was rejected at school because of my imperfections. That's the, the belief I developed. That I have to always be perfect, otherwise I'm not lovable, I'm, I'm useless. 
So we have to we have to work on that perfection or, or whatever the, the underlying belief is that we have. Then there's cognitive distortions such as mind reading. Sometimes we'll we'll look at somebody and we'll decide what that person is thinking of us. We'll think like, oh he he's thinking that I'm ugly or whatever. That's mind reading. That is a, a cognitive distortion. Predicting what other people will say or won't say. Filtering is when we filter the positive things out and only keep the negative as evidence that we are not good enough. Labeling um, is, for example, if you failed an exam, then you'll label yourself as a failure. I am a failure instead of just taking it as I failed this particular exam. Personalization is when you give yourself the blame for something, for example, um, if you're married and your husband gets home and he's in a bad mood, if you if you have the personalization cognitive distortion, you will immediately think it's my fault. He's mad at me or I did something wrong or he doesn't love me anymore. Overgeneralization is, for example, if if one person rejected me, all people will reject me. And then there is fear, anxiety, catastrophizing and obsessive thoughts that can also um, disconnect the amygdala from the prefrontal pathway, uh, from, the, from the prefrontal cortex. Um, then there's depression or loss of hope, grudges or unresolved anger, uh, guilt without mercy for self. You know, a, a lot of the times we hold on to guilt and we punish ourselves over and over and over for something we did. That's going to make the prefrontal cortex weak not respond to that feeling of guilt then there's denial when we deny we have a problem or um, deny we have certain character faults or relationship is issues and also denying biblical truth and resisting acceptance for example if you've lost something there are stages that you go through and the, the end result is that you have to accept the loss and many of us resist that acceptance and we just we refuse to accept that we've lost somebody or something and that keeps the, the amygdala firing also um, if we have unrealistic rules for ourselves that can also um, keep that stress response triggered uh, for example um, if this happens I will do that or um, I may never ever hurt anybody's feelings or if like stand up for myself or be self-assertive because then I will hurt somebody else. That's also a, a distortion. Self-awareness. Self-awareness is the conscious knowledge of one's own character and feelings. Self-awareness is one of the most important things um, to have if you want to recover from mental illness because it's self-awareness that helps you to recognize your symptoms, your mood changes, and your episodes. It helps to recognize um, the cognitive distor distortions. It helps you to recognize faulty beliefs, your thoughts, emotions, physical reactions, urges, and behaviors. It helps you to recognize your triggers and um, your underlying core wounds, your deeper wounds that are triggering all these th this cascade. Then. There was a time when I, when I was going through this bullying that I was struggling with some things at home as well. And it was because there was something I was missing, something that I didn't understand, which I only started to understand when I found out about a book called The Five Love Languages. The five love languages, how to express heartfelt commitment to your mate. Now, this is written by Gary Chapman, and he's got other books also on the five love languages written to parents, how to understand um, their children's five love languages, and so on. But this particular one is the one that I read the five love languages, how to express heartfelt commitment to your mate. And it's a very short, it's a thin book, and it's easy to read, and it helped me to understand that people have different uh, ways of expressing love and in a family it can cause confusion if 
the one person thinks that love is um, love should be given and received through words or um, another person thinks that love should be given and received through gifts or through through physical affection or um, acts of service and then the, the last one is quality time so each person has a favorite love language a favorite one that they want to give and receive love with and if different family members speak different love languages it can make you feel like that person doesn't love you when in fact they do but they're just showing it in a different way um, so that I encourage people to read that book it was really an eye-opener for me and then also there's attachment styles which is also very important um, because it can also make you feel like you're not connecting with somebody in within a family um, people develop different attachment styles in their childhood due to their experiences and there are four major um, attachment styles the first one is secure the second one second one is avoidant the third one is clingy and the fourth one is push pull so a person with a secure attachment style is um, he feels secure in a relationship he feels comfortable to open up about his feelings he feels comfortable to express his needs and he doesn't have any insecurities he doesn't feel um, he, he, he doesn't fear abandonment or ha he doesn't have anxieties he feels comfortable and secure a person with an avoidant attachment style avoids opening up about how they feel they avoid intimacy they, they keep people at a distance People with the clingy attachment style always need confirmation that they are loved. They always need to hear from the other person. They, they need to be around other people to feel that they are loved. And then there's the push-pull um, attachment style where it, it alternates between the avoidant and the clingy. So sometimes you will push people away and you don't want any intimacy and then you'll switch over and you'll suddenly need them and, and you'll pull them towards towards you so it's important to to um understand what your attachment style is and also the the attachment style of the family members um i have a link on my website uh on the resources page in the under videos there's attachment styles there you can Go and have a look at that video and that will help explain it in more detail okay then managing triggers <laughs> that was one of the, the most difficult things for me to to get control over um so basically a trigger is an internal or external event that causes an intense emotional reaction and people who, who have a weak prefrontal cortex and an overactive amygdala will most likely react through um, negative thoughts and feelings such as sadness, fear, loss of hope, um, hatred, anger, that kind of thing, and self-destructive behaviors such as using substances, fits of rage, recklessness, um, binging, self-punishment, impulsiveness, violence, etc. Um, so I, I worked on um, developing strategies for myself that I started to use to gain control over my um, reactions um, to triggers. And for, what worked for me was to, to um, deal with a trigger in two steps. So the first step is what I call cooling the trigger and then the second step is cognitive behavioral therapy because when I was triggered say somebody made me angry or somebody insulted me because I had all these experiences at school I was very sensitive to criticism or insults or anything that reminded me of the, the bullying at school so I, I would react with extreme um, rage if somebody said something that triggered me so for that initial stage I needed something to first cool me down before I could do any emotional processing 
So step one, there are four um, categories that you can use as a as a, um, a strategy to cool to cool those initial emotions down first, so that you can use the cognitive behavioral therapy. I've got some examples here. For example, if the trigger is loneliness, um, an old habit might be that you would go and hunt for love. Say, for example, at bars or wherever, if you've got that intense feeling of loneliness. But now you want to change that habit and you want to change your triggers so that you can have uh, healthy reactions to your triggers. And then you put just put a reminder there for yourself why you want to change this behavior and, and put reminders there to help you, you think differently about your triggers. So if you're feeling lonely and you're feeling, I want to go and hunt for love, then put a reminder, say for example, love and connection may be scarce, but I can make myself happy. Then there's four options there. You don't have to do all four. You just pick one because it depends what mood you're in. Sometimes you won't want to um, use a spiritual strategy. Sometimes you'll rather prefer distraction or an outlet or relaxation. So there's four options when you feel loneliness. You can create a spiritual goal. You can do something special for someone else as an outlet, um, uh, no, as a distraction, sorry. And then as, as an outlet, you can go, say, to an animal welfare and show love to a little, you know, like a puppy or, or a cat that needs love because it helps to, if you convert what you need and you give it to somebody else, it, it helps to take that pain away. Or you could go for a massage. So you have to figure out what kind of strategies will work for you because what works for me might not work for you. But you can work out your own strategies. Here's a few more examples. Boredom, if you're, if you're in the habit of indulging in media when you feel bored, you can put a reminder, doing something valuable with my time is more rewarding. And then you can choose either a sp spiritual strategy, like watching a biblical video online, or a distraction strategy, like washing your car, um, an outlet st strategy, like creating something, or relaxation strategy, going for a walk in nature. So then once your initial reaction, emotional reaction has calmed down, then you can use cognitive behavioral therapy to resolve the trigger. And I've got an example here. Say, for example, there was this one, one, one morning I, I got up at, at um, three o'clock in the morning and I tried a new recipe for making a gluten-free pie dough and I spent from three o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> making these pie doughs and they flopped. And obviously I was extremely angry. I was triggered and my my end result, my, my behavior was an anger outburst. But now because a, a trigger happens so quickly, you have to go back and, and look at what happened in slow motion so that you can train your brain to, to use cognitive behavior behavioral therapy when you are triggered um, so that you can actually stop um, your trigger from from ending up in an ang anger outburst for example in the future so I've got here um, the the core wounds that were the underlying core wounds core, core wounds that triggered this whole cascade was that I was bullied in school because of imperfection, which then created the beliefs that imperfection is unlovable, imperfection is worthless, imperfection is embarrassing, imperfection is devaluation, it's anger and it's sadness. So when the pies flopped, all these emotions were triggered because of the, the core wounds that happened in my childhood, that if I'm not perfect, I am unlovable. And that eventually turned to anger and an anger outburst. So then um, I looked at the body reactions, you know, increased heart rate, flushed face, um, the impulses. When I felt all those, those, those feelings, I wanted to quit my cooking. I wanted to hide the pies. I even wanted to smash the pies. Um, and I felt like shouting. 
And then my behaviors were, I had an anger outburst and I shouted that I'm not going to give these pies to anyone and I'm done with cooking. Um, so then I resolved those emotions after the trigger and I, I found a way to look at it differently so that it doesn't trigger me in that way in the future. So I said to myself, imperfection is part of being human. I will improve by learning from the experience. Even great artists become uh, practice to become better as well as inventors. Tom and Thomas Edison, the famous inventor said, I have gotten lots of results. I know several thousand things that won't work. Um, so through this exercise, this cognitive behavioral therapy exercise, I trained myself to, to look at it differently in the future when, when I fail at something. It is, it's not the end of the world if I, if I fail. So then the action that I'm going to take in the future is I'm going to keep trying to create a pie dough that I'm satisfied with and I will remind myself before I do an experiment that failure is, failure is okay because the experience is teaching me something. I am an inventor. And over time, when you practice these strategies, like the, the cooling strategy and then the cognitive behavioral therapy. You won't need to do step one anymore. I don't need to do step one anymore when I'm triggered. If somebody makes me angry, I don't just react anymore and have a, a, a fit of rage. I actually slow down and I feel the emotions, the anger in me, and then I analyze it and I use cognitive behavioral therapy to prevent myself from having the, the anger outburst. So I don't even need step one anymore.